We're doing a series, Five Things You Can't Do Without. And for a review, those things are, first of all, you can't do without faith because Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Second, you can't do without works because James 2.26 says, faith without works is dead. And third, you can't do without the blood of Christ because Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Those three messages, by the way, are available in booklet form if you missed them or if you want to read them again, hear it again in print. There, these booklets are in the lobby. Today we're in part four. You can't do without holiness because Hebrews 12.14 says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And next Sunday, we'll wrap up this series, Lord willing, uh, talking about how you can't do without Jesus because Jesus said in John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. So, um, <clears throat> this morning then, we're looking uh, at Hebrews 12, 14. Make every effort to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist Church, and he once said, to raise up a holy people is the mission of the church. In my study of holiness in preparation for this message, I found one writer who said, if you're not a holy Christian, you're not a Bible Christian. Wow. Is that an overstatement? No, it isn't. Holiness among Christians is a credit to our holy God. It's also a strict requirement of anyone who wants to become a child of God and go to heaven. There are no exceptions. So my first point this morning is this. What does holiness look like? Um, Let me see here. Um, if I got now, I have to find the right one. Christopher Hall. Let's see. Yeah, here it is. Here is an issue of Christianity Today magazine, and in this particular one, uh, it quotes Christopher Hall: "To be holy is to be human in Christ, to find in Him our life's purpose and direction." and through union with him to become what we were designed to be from the very beginning. Well, that's, that's uh, really nice. Here's J.I. Packer's book, Keep in Step with the Spirit. And in here he defines holiness as follows. Holiness is closeness to God. It is, in essence, Obeying God, living to God and for God, imitating God, taking his side against sin, doing righteousness, performing good works, following Christ's teaching and example, worshiping God in the spirit, and loving and serving God and people out of reverence for Christ. Well, that's really a good way to put it. Someone else said, holiness is Jesus in modern clothes. It is growing more and more to be like Christ. Now, on the cover of my Bible right here, and maybe yours too, it says, Holy Bible. We call the land of Israel the Holy Land. We call Jerusalem the Holy City. So then, what makes the Bible, the land of Palestine, and the city of Jerusalem holy? Here's the answer. They all belong to God. The Bible is God's word. Palestine is God's land. Jerusalem is God's city. And that's what makes them holy. And in the same way, what makes us holy is that we surrender our lives to the Lord and we say, Lord, I, I belong to you. I'm, 
I'm all yours. Now I'm going to point out some of the qualities of the holiness described here in Hebrews 12, 14. And here's the first. Holiness is practical, not just positional. There are two kinds of holiness. Positional holiness is the right standing with God because your faith is in Christ. When you become a Christian, God places you in Christ. That is now your position. And it's an act of God that happens to you automatically. Practical holiness is different. It's a daily growth in holy virtues such as uh, love, faith, commitment, forgiveness, and showing kindness. Our key verse, Hebrews 12, 14, begins by saying, make every effort to be holy. That proves that the holiness spoken of in this verse isn't yet fully in our grasp, and therefore it cannot be positional holiness. Because positional holiness is a done deal that takes place instantly and automatically when you trust in Christ. The holiness in this verse is a progress, not a finished goal. Here's another issue of Christianity today. And in this one, uh, it quotes John Stott. I love John Stott. He writes, You can become a Christian in a moment, but not a mature Christian. Christ can enter, cleanse, and forgive you in a matter of seconds, but it will take much longer for your character to be transformed and molded to his will. It takes only a few minutes for a bride and bridegroom to be married, but in the rough and tumble of their home, it may take many years for two strong wills to be dovetailed into one. So when we receive Christ, a moment of commitment will lead to a lifetime of adjustment. Yeah, he hits it right on the head there. That illustrates how holiness requires practice and is not automatic. So the author of Hebrews is talking about a practical holiness and not our positional holiness here in Hebrews 12, 14. Now the second thing about it, Holiness is transformation, not reformation. Some people assume holiness means turning over a new leaf and reforming your life. Far from it. The Holy Spirit wants to turn us inside out. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That suggests that the purity God wants to see in us is something that comes from our hearts and not just our behavior. Unless our goals, purposes, and standards are in the process of being remade, we aren't experiencing the holiness that is indispensable to seeing God. Holiness is not something we manufacture. It's a work of God's grace. You and I can no more produce holiness than we can create the universe. And that means we must surrender to the Holy Spirit. You and I are responsible to obey God's command, but we're dependent on the Holy Spirit for the power to do it. Here's a third description of holiness. Holiness is seen in pure deeds, not pure doctrine. Listen to the Contemporary English version of our key verse. Here is the contemporary English version right here. It's, it says, live a clean life. If you don't, you will never see the Lord. That's our same key verse, Hebrews 12, 14. That implies that it's not just holiness or holiness that God is looking for, but a holy life. Now, here are some other Bibles. Here's the Living Bible. God's Word version, Good News Bible, here's the New English Bible, and all of them have the common denominator that in Hebrews 12, 14, this verse, instead of saying without holiness, they all say without a holy life, 
no one will see the Lord. So listen to what the Apostle Paul said about holiness in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 7. It is God's will that you should be holy, that you should avoid sexual immorality. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. A missionary in India was giving a Bible study to a group of Hindu women. And in the middle of the Bible study, one of the women got up and left. A couple of minutes later, she came back and listened more intently than before. When the Bible study was over, the leader said to this woman, I noticed you left in the middle of the Bible study. Were you, were you bored? She said, oh, no, I wasn't bored at all. I, I was just so impressed with everything you were saying about Jesus that I went outside to ask your carriage driver if you really live the way you talk. And when he said that you do, I came back in to soak up every word you were saying. So our behavior is the telltale sign of our conversion. Without holiness that proves itself in clean living, we won't see the Lord. Here's a fourth description. Holiness is proven by repentance from sin, not remorse for it. Remorse is when you're sorry you got caught, and repentance is being sorry that you hurt God. If we show remorse for our sins, we'll fear, fear God's punishment, but repentance will make us fear sin. Repentance leaves us disgusted with sin because it's sin. It compels us to turn away from anything that dishonors God. Let's take the case of two alcoholics. The first man is very sad. And the reason he's sad is that his wife and children keep pleading with him to give up his alcohol. Now his alcohol abuse is ruining his marriage and it's ruining his family life too. But the only thing this man is sorry about is that his wife and children won't let him drink in peace. The other alcoholic is also sorry, but for a different reason. He sees all the pain that his alcoholism has inflicted on his wife and children, and it grieves him to think that he has hurt them like that. He is so sorry for the devastation he has caused in, in his own family that he enrolls in a substance abuse program, and he graduates from it. And when he comes out of that substance abuse rehab center, he makes himself accountable to a sponsor. He checks in with the sponsor every week to give an account of himself. And he does everything he can to stay away from the alcohol. The first man had remorse. The second alcoholic showed repentance. And only the latter made it his goal to change his life. The holiness that God requires has this deep work of repentance. On the same night Judas betrayed Jesus, Peter denied him. Both men suffered anguish in their hearts, but what a radical difference we find in the outcome of their lives. Peter wept bitterly after he disowned Jesus three times. After our Lord's resurrection, Jesus asked Peter three times, Do you love me? And all three times Peter replied, Lord, you know that I love you. And thus Peter demonstrated repentance because he was grieved that he had let his Lord down. Judas, on the other hand, felt only remorse after he betrayed Jesus. The only thing he was sorry about was that his plan had failed Little wonder then that he soon committed suicide, very tragic. Judas had been a disciple of Jesus for three years, but his mere remorse revealed that he was a stranger to holiness. After Judas died, the Bible says in Acts 1.25, Judas left to go where he belongs. 
That is a polite way of saying that Judas went to hell. He had to go there because no one can see the Lord without holiness. And then fifth, holiness is separation from worldliness, not satisfaction with it. Moody Magazine here quotes British author Leonard Ravenhill as follows. The greatest miracle that God can do is to take an unholy man out of an unholy world, make him holy, and then put him back in that unholy world and keep him holy there. Greatest miracle God can do. Now, the Greek word for holiness comes from a root that means different. God wants us to be different from the non-Christian world. Our moral standards, lifestyle, vocabulary, and goals should be fundamentally different from those of worldly people. Worldliness says, reach the top and step on people to get there. But holiness causes us to be servants of others. Out in the world, it's a dog-eat-dog, put-yourself-first environment. But a holy Christian will consider others more important than self because a holy Christian is different. And then the next thing to say about it is that holiness is steady, not sporadic. When people speak of someone with a holier-than-thou attitude, they have a hypocrite in mind, don't they? This is a guy who pretends to be holy, but he practices the same sins he condemns in others. It's come to the point where people automatically think of a phony when you mention holiness. Well, at least they understand that regular holiness is a sham Uh, that irregular holiness is a sham. If our holiness appears only on Sundays, it's worth nothing. In recent years, Mary and I have vacationed for four or five days in, in Pismo Beach at the end of May every year. We found a group of men who play tennis over there, and we like to play tennis, so... We asked them if we could join, and they said, sure, come on, and they welcomed us, and, you know, we're in this big group of men playing tennis. Well, there was this one guy who just let loose very loudly with the the foulest four-letter words you can think of every time he made a mistake on the tennis court. And, you know, these guys are just duffers. He made a lot of mistakes, you know. Okay, so three days go by, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And Mary and I say to the men, we announce, we're driving back to Dinuba tomorrow, so you won't be seeing us uh, till next year probably. So thank you very much, and we are saying our goodbyes to these men. And this same man with the foul mouth came up to me, and he shook my hand, and he said, Tom, it was so nice to play tennis with another brother in Christ. (laughs) Now, I didn't say anything to him, but what I wanted to say to him was, I would never have guessed that you were a brother in Christ by the sound of your vocabulary. Uh, So, his holiness wasn't steady. Now, hey, we're all imperfect. But unless we can show some kind of consistency, some trend in our holiness, we can't claim to be holy. Now to the second main point. Why does God require you to be holiness? God permitted clean and unclean animals in Noah's Ark but he doesn't allow an unholy person into heaven. If God banished the greatest angel from heaven, he won't make an exception for us. And so back to our passage again, our key verse, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. 
So why does God require you and me to be holy? I've got three answers for you. Number one, because an unholy person is God's enemy. Romans 8, 7 says so. Listen to this. A person becomes an enemy of God when he is controlled by his human nature. Wow. I don't want to be an enemy of God, and I'm sure you don't either. Then we need to get serious about holiness. Now notice what Romans 8, 7 does not say. A person becomes an enemy of God when he is imperfect. Well, if it said that, there'd be no hope for me and no hope for you either. Fortunately for us, it's possible to be imperfect and still surrender ourselves to the control of the Holy Spirit. That's what spiritual growth is all about. Here's a second reason God requires this. Because holiness is the proof of God's work in your life. A handful of times in the Bible, God commands us to be holy because He is holy. In the book of Isaiah, God is called the Holy One 34 times. The very title of the Holy Spirit for the third person of the Trinity shows us how essential holiness is to God. So then, to be holy is to be like God. And if we're unlike God, a work of grace has never been performed in our hearts. We haven't proven ourselves to be Christians, but have given evidence to the contrary. That's why we can't see the Lord without holiness. And then here's a third reason God requires it. Because even heaven would be hell to an unholy person. We learn from Isaiah and the book of Revelation that the residents of heaven never stop chanting, Holy, holy, holy to the Lord. We sang that song, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, this morning. And a bunch of other songs about holiness. Thank you, worship team. Now, imagine an unholy person in heaven. He has no taste for holiness. Yet the never-ending chant of holy, holy, holy is like an echo in his ears. It would drive him crazy. He'd request permission to transfer to hell just for, to get some peace. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Unless we receive holiness on earth, not only we can't see, but we wouldn't want to see the holiness of heaven. And then here's my third and final question this morning. How can you become holy? One of the secrets to becoming holy is found at the beginning of today's key verse, Hebrews 12, 14. It says, make every effort to be holy. So, there is some kind of effort that we need to put forth, but it's not the effort where we clench our fists and we say, I am going to be a holy person if it's the last thing I ever do. No. Instead, it's the effort of using the tools that God has given us to make us holy people. I'll tell you three tools that God has given you and me to make us holy people. Number one, the Bible. Two, prayer. And three, the Holy Spirit. If you and I are going to live holy lives, we have to read our Bible, we have to pray, and we have to depend <coughs> On the Holy Spirit. Now, um, think of holiness as an airplane you're flying in. Now, by the way, this airplane, that is my father, the pilot, and that is his personal airplane. He's, my dad lives in heaven now, but that's a Cessna 180, and uh, that was his airplane. 
So we're going to think of holiness as an airplane you're flying in. Now, you know, when you fly, it's something of a miracle because we human beings are totally unable to fly, you know, just in our bodies. It's a miracle that, that you can fly. And it's also a miracle that you can be holy because holiness will never be produced by sheer human willpower. So, looking up at this airplane, uh, we all know that an airplane has three wings, and you can see all three wings on my dad's plane. The left wing, the right wing, the rear wing. I'm going to give those wings names now. The left wing of the airplane we'll call the Bible. The right wing we'll call prayer. And the rear wing we'll call the Holy Spirit. Now, if you don't read your Bible, it's like cutting off the left wing of your airplane. And when you do that, your airplane is going to take a, a nosedive and crash. If you don't pray, it's like cutting off the right wing of your airplane. And if you do that, your airplane is going to take a nosedive and crash. If you don't depend on the Holy Spirit, it's like cutting off the rear wing in your airplane. And when you do that, well, you, you know what the, what the result is. If your plane is going to fly, the left wing, the right wing, and the rear wing all have to do their jobs. And if you're going to lead a holy life, you need to be reading your Bible. You need to be communicating to God throughout the day in prayer. And you need to be depending on the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Here is Wilbur Conkle's book, more living hymn stories. And one of the hymns he talks about in this book is the hymn titled, Take Time to Be Holy. Now he leads up to that by telling this, uh, instead of reading it, I'll just tell you the story in this book. Wilbur Conkle uh, had his car needing repair, so he took it to a mechanic and the mechanic fixed it for him. And Conkle thanked the mechanic for his work as he gave the keys back to him and, and Wilbur Conkerl says to the mechanic do you go to church on Sundays and the mechanic said no my boss can't spare me on Sundays so I can't take the time Conkel said to the mechanic well one of these days your boss is going to have to give you time to die and the mechanic kind of stopped for a second and said yeah we all have to take time to die. We all have to take time to die, and yet we know many people make no time for God. And as a result, they take no time to be holy. Now let me read to you the couple of verses in this hymn by William Longstaff titled, Take Time to Be Holy. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Much time spend in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to him, uh, by looking to Jesus, like him you will be. Your friends in your conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, be calm in your soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus, led by his spirit to fountains of love, you soon shall be ready for service above. Yeah, <clears throat> that's, what, that's what it's all about uh, for us. Now, one word of caution here. We can't earn holiness. It's a gift. We do nothing to deserve it. It's all a work of God in the inner person. We can put it this way. Holiness is not the way to Christ. Christ is the way to holiness. And Jesus' transforming power can flow in us and through us now. Whereas the standard of a holy life is very high, it's not beyond the reach of any Christian. Because Jesus lives in us and is willing to live his own life through us. 
Okay, well, there's my instruction for today. Now I've got two action steps to send you home with. Here's the first. Let's think differently about the church. When I was a young pastor, I I kind of thought of the church as a reservoir, and the people were the water. The goal of the church was to fill up the reservoir with as much water as it could hold. If the reservoir started overflowing, we could always build a bigger reservoir, and that's what we did when we moved into this building right here in 1996. The bigger and fuller the reservoir, the more successful the pastor and the church looked. But there are a couple of problems with that illustration. First, the goal seems to be more about numbers and not change lives. And second, this is a frustrating model because in our fast-paced society, people are always moving on including the elderly and some not-so-elderly people moving on to their heavenly home. So my experience has taught me to see the church not as a reservoir, but as a flowing river. This river brings people to our church, but then it takes them beyond our church when they move on. One person spends five years in our church. Somebody else spends two years. Somebody else comes here for two months, and then the river moves them downstream. Our job is to help them grow in Christ for as long as the Lord has them here. The measure of our ministry is not how deep and wide the river is, but how much progress people are making toward a Christ-like life when they're with us here in this section of the river. And then my second action step is ask God in what specific way do you want me to practice holiness this week? Archibald Hart was one of my seminary professors and I love his definition of forgiveness. He says forgiveness means giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. That is a holy step to take. Or maybe God wants you to pursue holiness this week by loving someone you consider unlovable or by disciplining yourself for a daily quiet time in prayer and God's word or by giving up a bitter attitude you have toward God because of a trial he allowed in your life. I'm going to close by reading a poem out of this book, A New Call to Holiness by J. Sidlow Baxter. Baxter wrote a poem and put it in this book, and and here it is. This will be our closing. And and this, by the way, uh, is a prayer. So you might even bow your head and close your eyes right now while I read this and, and let it be your prayer too. With all my longing heart, now may I be completely set apart, dear Lord, for thee. And may there now begin the cure divine. Work miracles within this heart of mine. Enchained by subtle fear, my bondage see. Break in upon me here and set me free. All dark allure to sin in me replace by holy light within from your dear face. At last, true holiness may I now find in having you possess and fill my mind. Let risk seem what it will, my all I give, Lord, all my being fill for you to live. Amen.